thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, right, so this will be type of a survey of uh, some of the recent work on using data structure lower bound techniques and apply them to problems in cryptography. Uh, so, so let me start out with, with where it all started, uh, namely by looking at these oblivious ramps. So an oblivious ram, I, you probably know better than I do, is basically a method for encrypting the memory access pattern of an algorithm. So, so the setup is as follows. So you have a client who wants to run a program uh, on a large data set, but the data set is too large to store locally at the client. So maybe you want to outsource this data to the server and only fetch the parts you need uh, as you run your algorithm. Now the problem is maybe you don't trust the server, so you would like to keep your data confidential. And one thing you can do is, of course, you can always encrypt whatever you're storing, like every block of memory you, you encrypt it. So then just looking at the raw data, the server doesn't learn anything. Right? But the issue is if you're running an algorithm, and let's say the server knows what algorithm you're running. Maybe you're running a, your, your data is a graph, and you're running a breadth-first search. Uh, if, just the, if the server just observes which places in memory you look up as you're running your breadth-first search, it's clear that you can learn a lot about the structure of the graph just by looking at which uh, memory locations are accessed after each other, right? So, so just seeing the memory access pattern might reveal something about your data. Right, so the goal of these oblivious RAMs is to uh, prevent this from happening, so basically by scrambling or obfuscating uh, the memory access pattern of your algorithm, right? And oblivious RAMs are general methods for taking any algorithm uh, or any, and, and sort of hiding the access pattern, or encrypting the access pattern. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, we'll just assume that uh, the server just sees the access pattern, but not the contents of whatever you're storing in memory. Okay, because you can always encrypt that. And the security measures define like the following. So if you have any two sequences of operations uh, on the ORAM, uh, then you should that have the same number of operations, you should not be able to distinguish the two. Okay, so here it is in the picture. So basically what you want to do is, this is the RAM that I would normally use to run an algorithm. Uh, but it's too big to fit in memory. So what I'm going to do is I'm somehow represent this array at the server, right? So I don't have to re represent it as it is because that would probably leak information as I run my algorithm, but I'll try to, to make some sort of representation of, of this array in some sense. The, the, the memory is just a big array where you can read and write into to the memory. And the client memory is small and you need to support these reads and writes. And what the server sees are all these accesses into memory and I'll call these probes uh, to be consistent with maybe data structure lower bound terminology and also to distinguish reads, which are the operations you're simulating from uh, the, the probes you do into the server memory, okay? And of course you can consider this in a setup where uh, the server memory cells have W bits and the array you're simulating has only R bits, so they don't need to be the same. Uh, you have different trade-offs and there are some ORAMs that try to exploit different trade-offs between R and W. But for this talk, I'm just going to assume that one of these memory cells have the, they have exactly the same number of bits, the stuff you're storing at the server and the stuff you have in client memory, but it's only to make things uh, simpler. Okay, and what you care about here is the bandwidth overhead, which is in some sense if I'm simulating n accesses into memory and I'm doing m probes in order to hide what the sequence was, then my overhead is m over n. So it's just the, the factor extra uh, probes you're doing to, to simulate your, your uh, program. Right, so what's known about this? Uh, from the overbound point of view, already in the first paper that introduced the problem, there's a polylogarithmic overbound. And then there's been a lot of research on more and more efficient ORAMs, uh, some under different assumptions. Some have large client memory, some have small client memory, and so on. And in just last year, there was an, an ORAM which was titled Opt ORAMA, so it suggested this is optimal, uh, obtaining an overhead of just log n. Okay, so you can obfuscate any memory access uh, sequence by paying a log n uh, factor in the number of probes. So what's known about lower bound? So also in the paper that introduced the problem, uh, there was also a log n lower bound, but this lower bound only holds under several assumptions about how your ORAM operates. And I think the most crucial one of these, or, or least satisfying one is that it, it requires a balls and bins assumptions, which means that the only thing your uh, ORAM is allowed to do is to shuffle the, the memory blocks around, right? So it can just, it has to store the data as it was originally, just shuffled around. And then of course you apply encryption to it, but, but you just shuffle them around, that's all you're allowed to do. So that's like a, a balls and bins assumption. And of course, right, you could easily imagine that maybe you can use some error correcting codes or some XOR tricks to do better. At least to me, it sounds natural that maybe one can do, store some XORs of stuff and then maybe uh, you can still find the data that you need. And the second one is it only holds the low bound only applies if your ORAM has to be statistically secure, right? 
so this is where I, at least I got uh, into this area with together with Jesper from uh, our department. We proved the log in law bound for uh, ORAMs without any of these assumptions, right? So it holds uh, regardless of how you represent your data in memory, and it holds also for just computational security. Uh, one downside compared to this uh, law bound up here is that this one holds even if you know the entire sequence of operations in advance. Okay, so if your ORAM is allowed to plan what to do based on the entire sequence, this law bound here only holds in an online setting where reads and writes arrive online and you need to decide in an online fashion what to do. But anyways, all the upper bounds are in this online setting and that's, I guess, any application I could imagine because the data is too large to store locally at the client, so it doesn't make sense that you know the whole sequence in advance before you start running your algorithm. So, so I'd say that this is the, like a natural setting this online. Okay? Uh, it depends heavily on which type of statistics, I think. Uh, we can get back to that uh, maybe when you have shown you the lower bound. Maybe we can talk more about it. Are the upper bounds that violate the assumption? Say again? Are the upper bounds that violate the assumption? The upper bounds actually work in this balls and bins, but they are only computationally secure. Uh, so, so, in two, so this lower bound actually does not apply to the current best, the log and upper bound. Uh, no, it's not because of the balls and bins, it's just uh, it re uses some, some assumptions that... Okay, uh, good. So, so I'm not sure that low bound proof yet because I think there's a, just a simple low bound proof that's a little bit stronger. Uh, so, so this is sort of the next thing we looked at uh, when we started looking at this is that, okay, so, so here you, basically what you're simulating in an ORAM is an array with random access and you want to obfuscate the access into an array. But perhaps you could consider other types of, uh, let's say, data structures that you want to represent uh, at the server. So maybe for your application, all you really need is a linked list or a queue or maybe a priority queue uh, and in that case, maybe you can do better, right? Because say a stack or a queue only has, you can only access it in one end and you can only extract from the other end. So the access pattern is very constrained, right? So maybe there's hope of doing better than this login barrier if you, if you know that's uh, the case, right? So the lack of random accesses, so there's no login lower bound directly from based on this ORAM lower bound. Uh, so, so so one, one goal one could have in mind is to design, maybe you design a lot of efficient data structures and then you, for your application, you have just the right one that you, you need. Um, and that was indeed the purpose of a paper from 2014 that gave stacks and queues with log n probes, priority queues with log square n probes. And I guess if you look carefully at these bounds and you know your data structures, then these are a log n factor worse than the normal data structures, which means you might as well have taken the normal data structures and run them through the optimal ORAM. But at the time, uh, there was no uh, optimal ORAM. Okay, so at the time, this was better than running it through an ORAM. So it could suggest that these problems are perhaps easier to, to design uh, oblivious data structures for. And so the question is if we can do better, and unfortunately the answer to that is also no, uh, which is something we had at SOTA this year together with Jesper and uh, Rico. And I'll try to, to show you the proof now because it's, it's the same setup as for the ORAM, um, I think just give these stronger results. Okay, so we get a log and low bound for stacks and queues and priority queues and search trees and so on. Okay. So, so what is a st stack? If you had your introduction to elements course a long time ago, uh, a stack is just a data structure. You can push something on top of the stack. Uh, so here it's an R bit string, and you could also pop, which means remove the top element from, uh, from the stack. Right, so those are the two operations you need to support. And in this oblivious setting, we're given an upper bound in advance on the largest size of the, the stack can have during our sequence of operations. Okay, so we want to make such a stack oblivious. Uh, we want to prove a lower bound for, for such stacks in an oblivious setting. Okay, and I'm just gonna give you the, uh, the proof, uh, assuming there's no client memory at all, this is easy to get rid of. Uh, perfect obliviousness and, and this, uh, the number of, the bits that are stored in one element on the stack matches the word size, the, the block size. Okay, so just the simplest setting of, of parameters. Okay, so, so let me look, oh, this is far down. I hope you can see. So here, so basically what we do to prove this lower bound is we're going to consider a, secret, a hard sequence of operation, a hard distribution of over sequences of operations. Um, so here's a sequence of operations that are designed. So first, uh, in the first half of my 
n operations, I'm going to push uniform random bit strings onto the stack. Okay, one by one, I just push, uh, in this case, eight uniform random bit strings onto the stack, and then in the second half of the sequence, I'm going to pop them off again. Right, so that's, a, of course, if you're not required to be oblivious, this is really easy. You just push them onto the stack and take them off again. But what is the crucial observation here? So, so the crucial thing to measure here is, so let's divide the sequence operations into two halves, the first half of the operation and the second half of the operation, and then ask the question, while you're processing these pop operations over here, how many things will you have to access that was last time written in the first half of the sequence? Right, so does anyone have a guess? So I'm pushing eight random bit strings onto the stack and then I'm popping them off again. I guess the answer is there's a lot of information that I need to retrieve over here, right? Because the answer to these pop operations are these random bits that I pushed in the beginning, right? So I need to retrieve all the bits that are stored there. So if I, have, if I put, push eight W bits onto the stack, I need to retrieve eight W bits. So probably I have to read eight cells of W bits, right? Just because there's just so much information being transferred from the first half to the second half. This idea of, of measuring probes and the information that's transferred between several parts of a sequence of operations originates in this data structure low bound uh, paper by Mihai Petrasco and Eric Demain. Uh, it's called the information transfer method. And this is usually used to prove log and low bounds for data structures, but without any obliviousness assumption. Okay, so now, of course, we have to use obliviousness for something because otherwise you're not gonna get a, a higher lower bound because stacks are easy if you're not oblivious. And so here the, the trick is to say, now let's look at another sequence of operations. So this is a dummy sequence of operations. I just start by pushing uh, this all zeros bit string onto the stack. I do that eight times and then I pop them off again. Of course, this is a trivial sequence if I was not required to be oblivious because I don't even need to do anything. I know the answer is zero to all of them, right? So I just output zero every time. But now the question is, will I still need to do a lot of probes when I'm doing the second half of the sequence into stuff that was last time written in the first half? And the observation is that, yes, I have to do that because I need to be uh, oblivious. And what an adversary could do is in some sense, the adversary can look at what I'm doing when I'm processing my sequence of operations and then the adversary could just count how many times is the second half of the operation probing something that was last time written in the first half. Because that's something the adversary can see. So let's, let's have a look here. Um, so the idea is, so here's the adversary, uh, the server. So what it does is it looks at the first push, what do you write? And now I just mark those cells uh, in memory. And then I look at the next one, I mark the cells and I go on like this. So when I'm done with all the, the first half of the operations, the server knows which cells were written in the first half. And uh, then the server starts processing the second half and counts how many times does this read a green cell, right? And this was one. Maybe I probe these two. I don't read any green cells, so I don't do anything. And here I, I read two green cells, so I'm up to three now. And the, the, the observation is that if, if this was the blue sequence, the random sequence, then I, I know I have to do eight probes right, uh, just because by this information transfer. So I have to do eight probes. Um, and, and this means that it's because the, the adversary can just look at how many probes are being done. She can distinguish the two sequences if I don't do eight probes here as well, right. I have to do eight probes in this dummy sequence to be a, so, to not be a, so that the adversary cannot distinguish it from the random sequence in the beginning. Okay, so, so eight is the answer here again. And here's one assumption uh, that we make in our proof, and that is that your ORAM has to be secure even if the adversary knows which probes belong to uh, which operation, right? So, so basically what we did here, right, we, we knew when this stopped, right, that's, that's the crucial observation, we knew this split point. Uh, otherwise we couldn't, the adversary couldn't do this argument, but, but that's, yeah? It's, it's not completely clear from the example you gave, but this also takes into account the fact that it could be that one of the, say, you write in the first push operation somewhere, and then a later push operation might actually move the other round. Yeah, yeah. So Yes, yes, so we're only just measuring amount of bits that needs to be transferred. So it doesn't matter whatever it does to shuffle it, it's just an amount of bits. And there's some compression argument in the actual paper that, that makes it work. Uh, so it's not actual balls, but it's just the number of bits that needs to be transferred. Uh, so that's why it, it holds without balls and bins. Okay, so, so let me continue with the proof. So, so the trick now is to, let's look at another hard sequence of operations, a different one. So this, this distribution here has, first it has four push, then it has four pops, then it has four pushes, and then it has four pop operations again. So this is a different distribution. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to divide uh, time into four intervals instead. And then I'm going to measure 
uh, how, when I'm doing these pop operations, how much do I need to read that was written in the first four push operations, right? And the answer is the same as before, right? Because all this stuff over here hasn't happened yet, right? So it's in the future. There's, these have not even been updated, so they cannot help me. So basically, I just need to do these pop operations. Again, have to retrieve four W bits. So they need to read four cells that were last time written in this beginning, right? And I can do the same argument over here. These pop operations, reading stuff that was written even before this point in time, cannot help me because at that time I didn't know what these push operations were. So I couldn't write anything that could help me. Right? So, so basically, all the, inf the information that I need to find here about these elements being pushed can only be stored in the stuff that this sequence writes. Right? This is the only place you can find the information. It's in something that it wrote. So, so the answer is also four over here. Okay, and, but now, so now we can do the same trick uh, we have this red sequence of operations. Again, the dummy sequence, and the observation is that, that, that this has to be indistinguishable from this second uh, random sequence as well. Right, so, so it means that the adversary has, uh, the, 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 the ORAM has to again hide uh, which of the two sequences it is uh, it's processing. So, so you have to, during these pop operations here, these four ones, you have to read four things that were written during these four pop operations, just to, to distinguish, to not make it uh, um, look like the, that it has to be indistinguishable from the previous one, right? And now the whole trick is that the probes that you count in all these circles are distinct probes, and the reason is, if you look at it, the probes that you're counting there correspond to things that were written down here for the last time, and the probes you're counting up there were written over, over there, right? So they're all, uh, and, and next time it was accessed was on the other side. So, so you can, so in some sense, all these probes are disjoint uh, sets of probes. And now you go on, you create another sequence of operation, two push, two pop, two push, two pop, and so on. And you need, you have all this information transferred between these small intervals, and you need to do two probes in each of them. And again, the same has to be the case for the red sequence, the dummy sequence. And you go on until the, uh, until you get one probe. And now we're basically done, right? Because at each layer, there's a linear number of probes. Uh, and they're log n layers, so you have to do n log n probes in total. And so, and you're simulating n operations, so, so the overhead is log n, even if you allow amortization and so on. So it's, yeah? I have a question about your assumption that the adversary can tell. Uh, like, doesn't that follow from the online nature? Because online is something you need to process. Yeah, that's basically what we say, that because it's an online setting, it, it, it would, wouldn't be natural if security was based on not knowing when one of them ends, right? I think that, so I think it's a pretty natural that you can actually, that it's still secure even if you know. Uh, it's not just natural, isn't it? Like part of the setting of online? Isn't it the definition of online that you get one and you have to Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree, but, uh, well, uh, now I, don't, I don't know what I was, there's, there's a, okay, so there's a, Yeah, I think this is natural, but it is it is an issue with this proof. Uh, but so it's discussed here. So we assume that you need to know this, uh, and there's a talk later today that removes this assumption from the proof. Uh, it's based on looking at the graph of probes between cells and basically identifying the structures. Right? There still has there's still some structure in the probe graph, even if you don't know the the cutoff between things. That that's the basic idea. Uh, so. This will be covered later too. Removing this still assumes an online. Yes, it still assumes online. Okay, so an important quest part is also if you don't assume online, we're looking in the offline setting. If you manage to prove an, uh, a superlinear lower bound, you will also prove superlinear lower bounds for sorting circuits, which is a big open problem. So it's probably hard to remove this online uh, thing from it. Can always assume the sorting to be hard. Say again? Yeah, I, I, if you, yeah I, I guess so. If you assume a low bound for sorting, maybe you can prove conditional low bounds. But if you want something unconditional, I guess you either have to prove it, you'll have to prove an unconditional low bound for uh, circuits, superlinear low bound. So is there any difference between this proof and the, and the ORAM proof? Uh, not really, no. <laughs> it's basically the same. Uh, okay. These are just random. High level, uh, it's pretty much the same. I think we just didn't observe it the first time. And, yeah. Okay. So uh, I guess here's another uh, discussion about uh, let's also motivate something that's coming later today. So in this um, setup, that this hard uh, distribution that we had, right? These these random sequences are very different. 
right? So, so they're, they're, they're quite different from one another. And what if we only like make some, some other uh, assumption about what security guarantees do you want? And maybe you just want it to be hard to only distinguish nearly identical sequence of operations, uh, which is basically what's called a differentially oblivious uh, ORAM. And there will also be a talk later today by Pino, or no, I think it's uh, Kevin giving that talk, yeah. yeah so so there, there you can still prove a log and lower bound, uh, even for these differentially oblivious ORAMs, okay? And this uses a different, it doesn't use the information transfer technique, it instead uses a technique called the chronogram technique by Fredman and Sachs, uh, also from data structure lower bounds. Okay, uh, some more discussion. If, we, if you look carefully, there is actually, there was still a gap on these priority queues. Uh, you have log uh, squared n uh, probes in the upper bound, the construction that's known as log squared n probes. Uh, the lower bound only said you need log n probes. It was not the overhead that has to be log n. It's the number of probes that have to be log n. Uh, well actually, we have uh, follow-up work with Mark and Sarah that shows that you can actually get log n probes uh, for priority queues um, using techniques from I.O. efficient data structures, so normal data structures without obliviousness assumptions. So obliviousness is basically for free if you look at comparison-based priority queues that anyway have a log n lower bound uh, for normal priority queues. I guess a technical remark, if you're really interested, is that if you look at a priority queue, uh, if you assume that the data that you're storing is, uh, say, order log n bit integer values, then uh, our lower bound still holds the log n lower bound, but the upper bound can actually be made constant uh, time if you assume log n bit integer keys in a priority queue using total reduction from sorting and radix sort together with that. So, that's, so actually, there is, a, there is a, still a log n overhead for being oblivious if you, t if you try to exploit integer keys. If you just take a comparison-based priority queue, there's no overhead. Okay, technical remark. Uh, okay, so then uh, the second part of the talk, I'll, I'll sort of uh, try to motivate a new question we looked at. Uh, it's motivated by the fact that all we've seen so far are uh, proving lower bounds using either this information transfer technique or this chronogram technique. And they seem to, to peak at log n uh, lower bounds, these two techniques. So you're not gonna prove something stronger than log n. For, regardless of what the data structure uh, problem is. Uh, so, and, and what we observed was this priority queue could be made oblivious. Uh, even if you take a comparison-based one that has log n time normally, you could make it oblivious without paying anything. And so, so one question is, like, is obliviousness always for free if you are anyways pay, spending more than log n time per operation? In the sense that maybe the cost of being oblivious is the original time plus log n instead of the original time times log n. Right? That, could be a possibility. I don't know if it's reasonable to assume this, but at least it's an open problem whether uh, this is the case. And that's the, the question we tried to address in the, this next work, uh, where we tried to prove, can we pr prove that the total number of probes when you uh, are running an oblivious data structure has to be a little omega log n uh, for some problem. So this is the, like the second part, which is joint work with uh, Tal and with uh, Kevin, and also with Omri Weinstein from Columbia. Okay, so what's the problem that we look at? So the problem we look at is a uh, nearest neighbor search. So nearest neighbor search, uh, you're given n points in d-dimensional space. And uh, in this case, I'm looking at the distance measure being L1 distance, so the Manhattan distance, if you like. And, and so here, the, like this, this data structure problem, you have these points, uh, you get a query, which is the cross in here, and you'd like to find the nearest neighbor. But in general, there are these uh, reductions from the strong exponential time hypothesis that say that uh, this problem is really hard. You have to look at all the points, basically, uh, unless the strong exponential time hypothesis is false. So what people do in practice is they look at approximate versions of this, uh, where if my nearest neighbor has distance r, I have to find some one of distances most c times r for some constant. Right? So there's some approximation factor there. So that's the problem. So, so basically, this is my nearest neighbor, and it's okay if I return any of the green ones as well when I try to answer the query. So what's known? So the upper bounds of this problem are polynomial in to a constant, but a constant uh, that is less than one. And they are based on this locality-sensitive hashing, uh, most of these upper bounds. No, the di it's actually independent of the dimension, which is kind of interesting. Uh, well, maybe there's a... Maybe there's a times d for evaluating the distance function, but, uh, but in general, it can, and I think even you can, you can get rid of that for most distance measures. You can, you can even approximately compute the distance much faster than order d time, and, and, and you can get something like this. Okay. So, so what's known here? 
so this is a problem that's been well studied also, lower bounds, uh, without any obliviousness assumption. Uh, so here, if the st data is static, which means you don't need, to, you just get all the points in the beginning, you can pre-process and build your data structure. And then you don't need to support updates. You just, you just have your data, you can pre-process it, and then you have to answer these nearest neighbor search queries. Then if your data is like a Boolean vectors, uh, if you use S words of space in your data structure to represent these endpoints, then there's a lower bound of D divided by log of the space times the word size divided by the number of points times the dimension. Uh, so it's a little bit uh, tricky to pass. And let's say the trivial upper bound for this problem is, uh, the trivial lower bound is you need D over W just because the output, the nearest neighbor has D bits. So if you have word size of W, you need to read D over W cells to just retrieve the, the nearest neighbor. And so let's just assume for this rest of the talk that the words at the server precisely match the number of bits in a data point, just to keep things simple. Then all these bounds simplify a little bit uh, because then the trivial lower bound is constant. And uh, this lower bound here is still super constant. It's D divided by uh, the log of the space overhead over linear. Right, so, so this ratio is how much extra space am I using compared to just linear. And there has to be some trade-off if you think about it because if you use space two to the D, then you can store the answer to every single query and query time is constant, you just look up the answer. So there has to be some trade-off and if you put in, plug in about two to the D here, you'll see that it becomes constant. Right? So there has to be some trade-off between the, the space usage and the query time. Uh, if you go to the dynamic case where you get the points one by one, you need to support inserting new points. Uh, without obliviousness, there's nothing stronger known. The lower bound is the same. And by the same, I mean if my update time is TU, then the lower bound is D divided by log TU. And why is that the same? Well, it's basically the same if, if I'm... So basically, I, I can make a reduction that says if I have a fast dynamic data structure, I, I take my static input and I just insert the points one by one. How big a data structure can I build if my update time is TU? Well, I only have n insertions of points, so I can build a data structure of size n times TU. If you plug that in as a space, the n's cancel out and you just get a TU. Right? So it's just because if I, if I have small update time, then I don't have time to big, build a big data structure. That, that's basically the idea. And that's the best known, uh, even in the dynamic case. Okay. So, so what we do is we try to boost this. So we already start with a problem that has a super constant lower bound, and then we try to, to boost it by a log n factor uh, by applying obliviousness. Uh, so, so basically, the lower bound scales by a log n factor, but divides by another log of the update time. Okay. And, and here we really use the uh, obliviousness assumption. And I won't have time to describe all the tricks we, we do, but, but let me just uh, give, give you the main ideas. And this is like the first super logarithmic lower bounds for... Question, is there any, say, quantum form of complexity barrier for this? Like, is there any relation with the previous quantum form of the form with the I guess I'm not that enough into the area to, to give you an answer to that question now. And yeah, I don't know. But like, if you wanted to improve the lower bounds, you would say... Are there some barriers? Let me think. I, I guess here's one barrier, one concrete barrier that I think, is, let me just show you here. So, so one caveat with this lower bound proof is that there are actually other data structure problems where we can prove a similar uh, lower bound um, without using obliviousness. So, so in some sense, if we can move even higher up, I, I guess it, it would be a new type of bound in some sense. And these data structure lower bounds, the best ones are also pretty closely connected to uh, uh, low bounds for log depth circuits and stuff, especially in the static case. So, so there are some, I think it'll be hard to, to move beyond this, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay, so, so, so in one sense, this is a little bit sad about the result is it's not stronger than what can be proved for other problems, but it is actually the first time, that we, it's the first time we can scale uh, one of these static low bounds uh, or a dynamic low bound by a log n factor if we start from a problem with super constant complexity and also, uh, we were not able to do this without obliviousness assumptions, right? I think this has been a problem that pretty many people have in data structure low bounds have tried to do. So I think it is still uh, exciting. Uh, it's just a little bit sad that it's not even stronger than anything we, we knew how to do. Okay. 
So, so before, so, so to describe how we, we proceed, and this is a new proof strategy compared to the one I showed you before, uh, pretty much more technical, but I'll, I'll try to get into it here. Right, so, so first off, let me show you how the static proof goes. Like, how can you prove the static lower bound of D over log of the space overhead? Uh, so here you need to use, of course, some property of the data structure problem. And the property you're using here is that uh, the, the following. So let's say my point set is uniform random bit vectors. They just pick them independently, uniformly at random. And then there's this expansion property that says with high probability over this point set P, uh, if I take a set of queries Q uh, that's fairly large, so it's not all the queries that are the two to the D possible queries, but I take like two to the one minus epsilon D queries for some constant epsilon. So I take a lot of queries, but not all of them. Then all the nearest neighbor search queries uh, that correspond to these points will, if I collect all the outputs, will tell me half of the input set. Okay, so just, it's just something that all of these together uh, somehow have a nearest, have like very many different nearest neighbors, so together they'll collect all the points of the point set. Okay, so that's, that's the uh, observation we need about uh, uh, this, this problem here. And now let me try to sketch how one proves this uh, static low bound. There's no obliviousness assumption at, at all. So, so basically the setup is that if I have a data structure for the static problem, then if I build it on a point set, I get a representation in memory. So I get some RAM representation. It uses S cells. And now the trick is to uh, sample this uh, set of cells. So I pick a random sample of my memory uh, where I include each one of them with probability n over 4s. And why is that? Well, if you look at how many bits are there in total inside my sample, well, I start with S cells. Um, they have uh, W bits each. So the total number of bits is S times W times the sampling probability. So the S is canceled out, and then there's NW over four bits inside the sample. And, and if W and D are the same, all the, the cells in here have N times D over four bits. Does it make sense? So I'm just saying I'm picking a small sample of my memory. It is so small that the number of bits in there is not enough to describe the entire point set. Like that's, that's a crucial observation. It's not enough bits to describe the point set. Okay? So I have a, only a quarter of the number of bits to, that are necessary to describe the, the point set. Okay? But now, what can I do with this sample? So now what I can do is I can try to use this sample to reconstruct the point set. Okay. So how do I do it? I basically I just try to run the query algorithm of my nearest neighbor search data structure on every single query, all the two to the D possible queries. I just try to run the query algorithm. What the query algorithm does, it, it reads some cells in memory. Uh, and what I do is, whenever I read something from inside the sample, I know the, the contents of the bits, so I can continue the simulation. And if I read something outside the sample, I just abort this query and move on to the next one. And then the question is, how many queries can you answer based on this sample? So if I look at one query, if it reads T cells in memory, they all sample independently with probability n over 4s. So the probability that I sample all the T ones is n over 4s to the T, right? So straightforward. And now I just look, okay, but what if my query time was less than the lower bound I claimed before? If I have very small query time, then what is this probability? It's just two to the uh, minus little o of D. Okay, so, so what does this mean? It means I can answer a query with not very high probability, but still a reasonable probability that I can answer a query. So just by linearity of expectation, right, how many queries do I expect to be able to answer from my sample? I'm going to be able to answer two to the D uh, times one minus little o of one. Right? So I can answer a lot of queries from this small sample. But this expansion property at the top says that, well, if I have this many queries, all the output is going to tell me half of the points. Right? So what did I just achieve? Well, from this sample, I can answer a lot of queries that together output half of my point set. And each of these has D bits, so I learned N times D half bits about my point set, but uh, the, the number of bits in, this, in the cells were smaller. It's only N times D over four. So this is basically an information theoretic contradiction, right? Because these were uniform random IID bits, so there's just no way that N, N D quarter bits can reveal N D half uniform random independent bits. That, that's the sort of compression argument that we're using here. Okay, so, so that, that's the contradiction, and the contradiction is, of course, to this assumption that t is little o of uh, uh, d over log of the space over n. Okay, so that's 
uh, that's how you prove the static lower bound. Let's now try to see how one can lift it to an even stronger dynamic lower bound. Uh, so in the dynamic case, right, the points are inserted one by one, and at any given time, I should be able to, to answer queries. Uh, and my update time is a TU for each of them. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a technique of mine from 2012, uh, which is basically a combination of uh, the chronogram technique that you'll all see in the next talk and this sampling idea that you, you just saw. So what are we going to do? So the chronogram technique says that, well, if I want to prove a low bound for a, a dynamic problem, I consider a bunch of uh, insertions in this case, all the red dots, uh, and I do them one by one, and time moves from left to right, and at the end I have the, the query here, now it's green, uh, so that's the query. And then I'm going to divide these updates into what we call epochs. Right, so we have uh, epochs, and what are the size of these epochs? So these epochs, the jth epoch have si has size beta to the j for some parameter beta. Okay, so they, uh, the sizes are decreasing uh, as exponentially as you move towards the, uh, or geometrically as you move towards the query time, right? So they go down by a factor beta each time you, you move one epoch ahead, okay? So, so basically these, in some sense, these uh, insertions belong to the fourth epoch, the blue ones belong to the third epoch, the purple ones belong to the second epoch, and the orange one belongs to the first epoch, okay? Uh, so now let's look at what does the data structure look like uh, when you're done processing all these operations and you need to answer the query. So the idea here is to color the memory uh, based on these epochs. Okay, so, so the idea is to assign each of these memory cells a color corresponding to which of these epochs it was last updated in. Okay, so, so in some sense, if all these cells were updated during the fourth epoch but not during the third, second, and first, then I'm going to color them black and so on. And the ones I call up blue are the ones that are updated during the blue epoch, but not during the purple and orange one. It is okay if it was, if it was also updated here, I'm still going to call it blue, right? I call it based on the last time it was updated. Uh, good, and now what is the idea when you want to prove the lower bound? The lower bound, uh, what we want to do now is we want to prove that the query at the end has to read basically the static lower bound from each of these colored sets. And then we can sum them up and, and get the, the final lower bound right. So it has to read from each of the colored sets. And if we can do that, then the total lower bound becomes this log base beta of n, which is what's the number of these epochs times this uh, lower bound we had before. Okay. So now, how can one try to prove that you need to uh, read a lot from one of these epochs? So let's look at the third one, the blue one, and see why do, we, why do we have to read a lot from it? Okay, so the intuition is that if you look at everything that belongs to the previous epochs, everything that was last time written before epoch three, uh, then these cells were written in the past, right? It happened before these updates even arrived, so there's no way you can store any useful information, at least if the updates are independently chosen in the epochs, right? So they just can't contain any useful information. Uh, so in some sense, you can ignore these uh, cells. You can even assume that maybe the query knows them. Uh, they don't help you in answering uh, in revealing any information about the third epoch. Okay? You can also, let's try to look then at all these little epochs, the ones that uh, precede epoch three. And these one can actually contain useful information, right? Because uh, what you could do is you can try to read some of the blue stuff and move it around and, and stuff like that, right? So they can actually help you in answering the query. Uh, but this is where this uh, geometric decreasing size comes into play because you might ask, so let's try to set this beta to be the update time squared and see what happens. So how much is stored in all these epochs in total? Well, it's basically, so how much do they, do they uh, write? Well, there's basically beta to the j minus one updates in total there, right? Because this one is size beta to the j minus one, beta to the j minus two, beta to the j minus three. If beta is at least two, it's just dominated by, by the next one, right? So there's beta to the j minus one updates, each of them each update uh, changes at most TU things because TU is the update time. So the total number of cells in there is TU times beta to the J minus one. Uh, each cell has D bits. So, so basically you get, uh, let's see, did I make a mistake? Uh, yeah, so, so basically this is, if, if beta is TU squared, uh, 
right? You're missing a beta factor here, so, it's, so it becomes beta to the j divided by tu times d, right? So, so it's, the important point is that it's less than beta to the j times d, right? So you have less bits uh, of information than the number of bits it takes to describe the blue epoch, right? Because the blue epoch has beta to the j points, each uniform random d bits. So, so in some sense, all of these, even if you know everything that was written here, the blue points are still almost unknown. Okay, so this is much bigger than the, the next one. That's the, the crucial observation. So, so, so even if I tell you everything except the blue cells, uh, the points in the blue epoch are still pretty much unknown to you. So it's, it's roughly independent of the other epochs. So, so basically this, this means that in some sense you can treat the blue cells as a static data structure where you just hard code everything else uh, and, and you still, it's still a static data structure problem. That's, that's the basic intuition that the blue cells have to act as a static data structure that's independent of everything else. And then you can do cell sampling here just like the previous proof to prove this static lower bound uh, in here. Does it make sense? So this, just because all the other stuff, in some sense, even if I reveal it to the query algorithm, um, they can't help me. So the blue cells, I can do the same argument as before. I need to read a lot of blue cells. Otherwise, I can answer a whole lot of queries that tells me all the, uh, all the blue points. Uh, good. But uh, there is actually uh, a problem with what I just described. And let me try to, to show you what the problem is. Because we haven't used obliviousness yet, right? So so, so far, this would have just, just as well have worked even without obliviousness. And we don't have a stronger lower bound without obliviousness. So, so what you do instead is, uh, so all the, in the hard distribution, right, all the insertions were uniform random. So let's try to see what happens, right? If you overlay these epochs, it, it's going to look something like this, right? You get uniform more random points, and there's some more on top, and some more on top. And what happens if I look at this uh, a query afterwards? I try to answer a query to find my nearest neighbor. And then the problem is, my nearest neighbor is almost always going to come from the biggest epoch, right? Because there's just so many more points, so the nearest neighbor will always be black. Right. The black ones just cover all the space. So, so which means that my query, no matter how many queries I, I run, I'll always get black points back. So I, I won't learn these blue points from the blue epoch that the previous argument required me to, to do. Even if I do this cell sampling and answer a lot of queries, maybe all those queries just happen to have a black nearest neighbor. So I don't learn the, the blue points. So that's the, the issue here. And it's just because the first epochs are so much bigger. Okay, so which basically means since I'm not going to find the blue points, I might as well just not do any reads into the blue epoch. So the low bound breaks down. And this is exactly one of the reasons why we haven't been able to prove this uh, in the non, uh, without obliviousness. Okay, so, so, so then our second attempt is to try, okay, well maybe the problem here was that uh, the black points and the blue points were all on top of each other and um, and so, so it's just, you just always get a black point. So what one could try to do is maybe let's spread them out instead. Right? So just put them in different parts of space. So maybe one could allocate the first d half bits to say maybe some error correcting code on, on the epoch number or something. So just to put them far apart, right? So, so that all the black points would be somewhere in space, all the blue points would be somewhere else, all the purple points would be down here, and the orange ones would be here. Right? So the first half is something fixed that depends on the epoch number, and the second half is the uniform random bits. And now, at least now I can make queries that correspond to the hard static distribution for the, say, the purple ones, because I just take the purple prefix, the first d half bits, and then I make the, the query as I would have in the static problem on the remaining d half bits. So now I can place my query down here and I'll find the purple points. Right, so, so, so that's good, uh, because now, now I can choose which epoch to, to run my query and I, I can find the points. Uh, but, the issue is, again, uh, in some sense, if I'm, if I'm about to answer a query and I look at it, I can just look at the prefix and then I know whether, it's, whether I'm going to output something from down here, something from up there, or something from over there. So in some sense, again, I can just only read from the epoch that the answer is going to belong to. Okay, so, so this is again a reason why th this trick, I still didn't use obliviousness, right? So, so this trick also does not work without an obliviousness assumption. Uh, so basically, the data searching now just read only from the epoch corresponding to the query. And now we come to, to the obliviousness part. Um, so, so the observation is that if I have an epoch j, we can sort of place a query such that it's hard for that epoch. So I have to do a lot of reads from the cells belonging to that epoch. 
right? So I have to do a lot of blue. I can create a distribution over queries where I have to read something blue. Uh, but of course, we want to simultaneously force a lot of probes in, in all the, the epochs. And this is where uh, obliviousness comes into play, right? Because uh, if I try to answer my query, and it comes from, say, the blue epoch, I know I have to read a lot of blue things. Um, but if I had placed the query instead of in the black epoch, I know I would have to read a lot of black things. And an observer is not allowed to distinguish the two. Right, so, and the observation is here that the server can actually compute these black sets and blue cells and uh, orange cells as sets as well, right, just by running the updates and collecting uh, the cells in each one of them. So it means just to hide where the query is, in which part of uh, the input space it is, or which epoch it belongs to, you have to do all these reads for all of them, just to hide where your query is. So you have to do uh, yeah, these D over log to you from each of the sets to not re reveal how you placed your query. So that's basically the idea. Uh, and this beta was tu squared, right? So this is a log and o log tu, and we get the lower bound that we, we claimed in the beginning. Okay. Now, I didn't have time. There are more technical details to this because it doesn't just work uh, like this. Especially the, the, the main issue is uh, that these data, these data structures, I said here, they were independent because they don't reveal enough information uh, to help you. But that's actually not quite true if you try to work out the details. Uh, so, so actually, this lower bound here only holds for uh, statistical security. We have to use statistical security to, to, to make the lower bound work. So that's, uh, that's a caveat. Uh, but the idea here was basically you can, you can now define a hard distribution for a single epoch, and then you, can, you have to hide which epoch the query belongs to so you can sum up uh, these hard distributions. That is the basic idea. Right, so we need statistical security, uh, unfortunately. Uh, it's very subtle, and I think you have to read the paper to, to get the details of, of how we circumvent this, but it's, it is pretty, pretty subtle. Um, so the main issue is they're not independent enough to treat them as static data structures and the cell sampling doesn't in itself work. Um, yeah, that, that's the, the, the main, main problem, right? And statistical security uh, solves this. Okay. So uh, I think there are a bunch of interesting open problems here. Uh, so, so one of them is, can we prove these super log lower bounds even if we just, uh, so without this statistical security requirement, can we prove it if you just require computational security? So I think that's a good open problem. Uh, other natural data structure problems, I think like an interesting one, a fundamental data structure is a search tree, like predecessor search, so you're given a set of keys, so it's say integers, and the query is find the largest integer less than me. It's a basic data structure, and was also amongst the ones they gave a log squared and upper bound for. We saw that the, pr the priority queue could be improved from log squared to log, but what is the, what's the case for search trees, right? Can you do something better than taking this, the, the normal solution and applying a ORAM to it. Right, so I think that's it. And I, my intuition would be that if you would try to do this, this technique should help. Somehow you can, because search trees, if you search on integers, the running time is the same whether you're dynamic or static. So there's still a static lower bound. So the hope is you can try to use these epochs, prove a static lower bound on each, and sum them up. I think that, that's an interesting direction. There are some things that don't work if you try to do this, but, but I think that's a good open problem. Uh, can we find other applications of these ideas? And th this work here, uh, which just accepted a crypto, is not really, so we're not using that much data structure low bound techniques, but I think it's inspired by this proof. Right, so the, all the proof we just gave was based on multiple hard distributions. And then because you have security, you cannot distinguish which you, you have to basically do all the work for all the hard distributions summed up. Right, that's, that's basically the idea. We use a similar idea here to prove low bounds for uh, secure multi-party computation, where uh, we want to evaluate a circuit amongst a set of n parties. And the basic idea in the proof is we can define one hard distribution that makes one player talk a lot, then we can define another hard distribution that makes another player talk a lot, and we do that for every single player. We can define a specific hard distribution that makes that player say a lot, and then we can sum them up because you have to not reveal uh, the input, so you don't know, uh, like, so all the players have to talk a lot, basically, to, to not say, reveal any information. So I think this idea is interesting. I, I, I'm not sure it's, it's not really a data structure technique, but I think it's still something that one could try to use. And maybe you already do it in a lot of other places that might be the case. I don't know. Um, yeah. So I think here's some work here. Uh, I think it's, it's still a fairly interesting result. It's about these uh, lower bounds for general access uh, 
uh, secret sharing that we just uh, saw Amos' talk earlier. Uh, so what we prove is, I don't know, maybe you like the result, maybe you don't. Uh, but, but basically what we prove is that either the share size is exponential or the description, the, the size of the function you use to uh, reconstruct the secret has to be exponential. Okay, so what does it mean? I guess in practice it means that if we want to do secret sharing amongst n parties for general access structure, each of the parties has to use exponential space to store the decoding function, uh, or you have to have exponential large uh, shares. I, I guess, I don't know, some are surprised, some are not surprised, but, but at least this is, uh, proof is, it is a, a counting argument, but it uses some of these encoding techniques similar to, to what we just did here. Um, yeah, I guess it also, this, this result also says that uh, if, you're, uh, if you insist on decoding via a Boolean circuit, uh, then the share size has to be exponential. So, so there's some, some interesting things there. Yeah, I think that's... Oh. No, we said that if you insist on decoding using a Boolean circuit, either the share size is, you know, this Boolean circuit actually has to be exponentially large. Yeah, so, so that's basically what it, what it says. The decoding function has to be exponentially large, and, and so, yeah. Yeah, I think that's what I wanted to show.